I think memory is much more important than haste. And, uh, and I think that in Spanish there's a very good word called ocio. Ocio means to say the time you spend just thinking, just browsing, just reflecting. That time doesn't exist anymore. We are all the time having to make very stringent use of, of, of whatever, whatever we have available. So this first part is a little bit more poetic and it's trying to tell you that we're living in kind of 18th century institutions. We're being governed by still something that was uh, not, not adequate for the time we're living. So we need to reform the institutions, the policies, the laws that make up the city. Because informality is the new normality. I said informality is the new normality. We need more ethics and less aesthetics. What we need is a new vocabulary. They schooled us in the art of unwavering beauty, presented us a glittering pantheon, said, see that, conform. They anointed us as experts of new arbiters of design. Saw cities as personal canvases, go brand your skyline. But informality is the new normality. First part I'm gonna do is about our values. Second part is what we call incremental housing. It'll be represented by this this tower, monumental tower, squatted tower in Caracas called Torre David. And the third will be a case study and how we apply our urban toolbox. Um, but more importantly, what we need to do is change the way cities are being urbanized around the world. We believe that identification of simplicity in this complex urban form has led us at the beginning of century to develop a concept called the urban planet. This idea embodies uh, the idea of the modern macropolis or one globally connected city. If we accept that idea, we're in a unified urban planet. Then we can reassess development on the basis of our built city ecology. The global metropolis is in a process of linking up. And we need to find out and understand in, in the way what we call activist design, why we design, what we interpret, and where do we act, and identify with whom to act. That's more important, because we're living in a time of a last round ecology. What you see here is just after the fire in South Africa, so in, uh, just outside of Cape Town. And this is what caught my attention uh, a few years ago. And you might know, some of you might have uh, visited even Masipumalele. It's a big story, about a thousand houses right there on the edge. You see all those very brightly colored tin shacks? Those are all new houses that have just been built up in the past weeks. Masi lost 1,000 houses. So the government says, Let's plan some new houses there in Masi. Of course, not enough, and you've got to ask, how are they planning that? Where are they going to put it? This is the, the terrain where all those houses burnt down. People are staking out their plot, sitting there, so they don't lose the right to the land, because they have a de facto right to that land. It may not be legal in terms, but it certainly uh, has, there has a, there's a de facto right. Now, what the government has done in very good will in an emergency plan is to hand out a starter kit of materials. That's pretty good because people could rebuild the you know, power to the people, let them rebuild their house. But what's happened is that they've rebuilt, rebuilt their houses in much more density, closer together, and more precarious. So actually, that was... It, 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 the solution of the emergency starter kit is actually much worse. Instead, what should have been done is something that we call, and Andy and I, Ikailami, and my partners at Design Space Africa, and many partners who you will see later, um, we call an advanced re-blocking, which means to take the people who have been living in their shacks and re-block them, move them with the engagement of the community, and create a normal and decent urbanization. Here are the images from Masi's fire. I'm just going to put it on for a second so you guys can, can witness 
how devastating it is to lose your house. And how we, how can we sit here and not do something? And there are thousands of young architects who would do something, but the city is not prepared and the people are not prepared. The problem here, we, all of us, most of us, there are no numbers. So we don't have boxes for electricity. See, the, the section is grouped in, 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 in numbers. So other shakes, they don't have numbers. Yeah. So now, most of us here, they don't, we don't have electricity boxes. Yeah. So now, people that they have, they have no boxes, they, 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 ask, they, they take electricity from the people who have boxes. So one box, there's only like, we connect like six people in one box. So at the end of the day, the box, the, the electricity get, get, gets tired and then it, it explodes. The fire catched my house here. As you can see that, I don't have a house now. I don't have clothes, I have nothing. My furniture is also burnt down, as you can see. But the problem is, the helicopters, there were three helicopters here to come and help us. But the only thing those guys did, they just put the water there to protect the houses from lakeside. You see, most there are suburbs there where the white people lives, live. So the only thing that they did with the helicopter, they didn't come and, and, and distinguish the fire. They only helped that side. If they came here and then they, they dropped the water here, this thing ha wouldn't have happened, trust me. So there you heard it. What we do is go in, we do investigations, we do research, we find the real story from the people. And we've been doing that around the world. We started in Caracas, Venezuela. We did quite a number of works until um, it was really impossible to work with the present government. And maybe you don't know, Caracas is probably the most violent city in the world at the moment, with 285 deaths by gunshots uh, each month. But we tried to see if Caracas is everywhere. So we went around trying things in Colombia and Brazil, and this was the first photograph of the first collective urban think tank, let's say. It's grown, it's changed, it's moved places around the world, but it's a combined group of individuals who are not all architects, but we all come together to think about the city. Because what we need is a new way of dealing with the city. The laws do not comply with the things on the ground. That's the real problem. So in the, let's say, 19th century, when you had Paris, the Industrial Revolution, you had the expansion and you had industrialization. In, let's say, in the 20th century, you had infrastructure, trains, suburbs, et cetera, cities being urbanized. And now in the 21st century, we need a new thinking of what urbanization is. Because what you have now is temporary, you have reuse, you have micro spaces, and you have informality. So we need a new thinking. So we put together a little exhibition, and we called it Radical Urbanism, which is bringing the kind of places you normally don't have on your mental map to the forefront. You know, uh, um, uh, refugee camps uh, and, and uh, slums from around the world. Let's see if we can get this to work. Yeah, so let me take you through one of those places to give you an idea why we should share knowledge. The point is, there's a lot of good ideas out there, if we can just see it. So this is just one idea and one place where we research, which is the Kummela in India, in the, on the Ganges River. This is a makeshift city. It's a temporary ephemeral city that pops up every 12 years, and about 30 million people come for 144 days. It begins as a military operation along the Ganges. They dam it up so that they can leave a beach to be, uh, to be occupied. It comes together. Everyone has their campsite. Um, very lightweight materials are used. Um, people set up very interesting shelters, facades, buildings, really lively, lots of color. And they receive, with free food and all accommodations in an Indian style, they receive 30 million people. That's pretty interesting. Why can't we design some kind of transitional, temporary, ephemeral spaces so that we can somehow reaccommodate all of those people in Kailiche, and Masipumalele, et cetera, and then rebuild in according to standard with the appropriate infrastructure? So we sometimes invent projects with our exhibitions. This is an exhibition in which we, the idea was scarcity. Let's use the cheapest available materials in each place. In this place happened to be Munich. And we used uh, water pipes, plastic water pipes, and just printed sheets of fabric with all of our projects. And it was like 
in Moroccan tent or the Kumela structures, let's say. And the pipes would then, once finished the exhibition, would go back to the industry and the sheets would be turned into bags, etc. Here you see some details. Of course, those pipes, they, the company, when we bought them from the, from the water company, they said we were insane to try and do an exhibition out of them. But it seemed to work, and with wires and cutting it and adapting those cheap systems, it looked actually pretty good, and it even felt like the informal markets of Mexico City. So what I want to say with that, this is just an exhibition, that maybe we should take inspiration from the street from what's actually happening. So in that exhibition, and just to show you what we've done, as the world will increase by one billion to 2000, 2025, we are working on bringing infrastructure to those places that need it the most. So we need music schools, we need sports areas, we need uh, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, and here I'll just give you a taste of one of them, which is the vertical gymnasium, where six on six used to play on a little small mini foot field, and it was controlled by gangsters. All the little kids couldn't play because the gangsters wanted to use the field. We told the mayor, let's verticalize it. Let's systematize it. Let's put several floors. Let's put volleyball and make multiple courts, tatami mats for the little kids. And with $600,000, with a steel structure, building it ourselves with the community, we were able to realize that. And this is an autistic children's school that function as a ramp, as a Guggenheim Museum, and as a spiral. And as the kids go up to their classrooms, they can go up on a ramp because they can't use an elevator. They get claustrophobic. And they can't use stairs because they can't walk up stairs. So they go up the ramp and they see the classrooms, they see nature, they see the clouds, and it's a way of getting them a little bit more integrated. But I won't bore you with some of our old projects. I'm actually interested. I'm interested in the now, in the next, in the new, and what we have to do. So, maybe some of you know, I am now uh, a professor in Switzerland at ETH Zurich, and I take my inspiration from Einstein, who graduated from my university, from ETH Zurich. And um, Albert Einstein, 31, you know him for his ideas, but you probably didn't know that he created the Institute for Intellectual Cooperation. And if there's one thing the 21st century is about, social media is sharing and cooperation. So he brought together renowned intellectuals to think about ideas about politics and peace. So I say we have to invent a university for the city. We have to create intelligent groups of people, economists, sociologists, anthropologists, architects, engineers, to come together to solve this incredibly difficult problem. Let's listen to David Chipperfield. Development, or a huge proportion of development is, is uh, not so much to build our cities or build the things that we really need, but they're part of generating money you know, it's, and uh, increasing, uh, you know, it's an industry. I mean, uh, there is a big industry out there like shipbuilding it's called construction, which is taking money, putting it into the ground and, and harvesting it. The market can be an ass, uh, and there's no question but that the slums are um, one of the key measures of the failure of the market to equitably accommodate the needs of all the citizens, citizens in a given society. So we need to intervene. We need to mess with the market in order to assure that it does good for all. So that's a little bit the philosophy behind our work. And just like India was influencing me, a few years back, South Africa is influencing me now. Because South Africa has probably, as you all know, I discovered it, one of the most modern constitutions what in the world. What can architecture do? Can architecture do anything? I mean, that's the question that you really have to ask. Are we just decorators now? I mean, are we just, is there just a band of sort of architects that go around trying to make everything look good? Archi so architects, as David said, have been complicit in the segregation of cities, as you know. And South Africa, of course, being the place where that became more poignant. So as a profession, architects uh, really need to think about that and need to do something, really act, 
So that does not continue to happen. But if you look at uh, Cape Town, for instance, and the maps of Cape Town, you will see that Cape Town is essentially the same city as it was pre-apartheid. Very little has changed. If anything, the informal sector of Kailiche and other places has grown. So look at what you, is happening in India. Same problem. Book a villa in peace and serenity. This little village, which is slated for demolition. People will be displaced. Luxuria. This is just the road coming from Bangalore, from the airport, into the city. Who needs this? Who is this? Are these boardrooms? Are these real estate companies? Who is doing this investment, right? So that's what our exhibition, which is called See and No, which is on now in Munich, um, is trying to say. Architects need to take a position. Designers need a position. I'm not saying be heavy. I, of course, I enjoy very much light-hearted ideas about design. But I'm saying take an ethical position like doctors do and lawyers do. But architects don't. They'll work for anyone, pretty much, right? So this is the situation of Caracas when I left it um, in 2005. All that you see in yellow was the first mappings of the slums of Caracas. Dire poverty, when we were uh, doing our work. That's, uh, there we go. But the history of architecture has lots of thinkers who came up and thought about these situations. And one of them was John Turner an Englishman at the AA. He went to Peru and Arequipa, again, sharing knowledge, going around the world. There's no way to be an architect or a designer today if you don't think global. Yes, of course, Le Corbusier may be in Paris, maybe Alvar Alto in Finland, maybe Mies van der Rohe in Germany. They were all doing their first works um, out of their local town, let's say in their city and their country. But nowadays, that's not possible anymore, because the problems affect all around the world. So you might as well see what's happening around the world. So we wrote this manifesto in Caracas. We said it was called the Manifesto No. I was a little bit upset at that time. We did not come here to follow courses of diplomacy. We didn't come here to acquire a culture with comfortable personal ends. We came to confront the urban problems and to call things by their name. We cannot maintain ourselves indifferent in front of the climate of falsehood in the city. So I'm a little more positive now. Um, and we've come up with a yes manifesto. It is possible, of course. And we started to look around the world. This is in India, fantastic low-cost housing that really is like a village in Araña, in Indore. Or you can look in Peru, Previ, 1970s project of architects. And there, there were many of them were renowned Pritzker Prize international architects who came down with the UN to make this whole neighborhood. And they made the neighborhood so that people could expand floors. So this is the idea that I'm going to put forth. Why? Because if this is the state of the world, and we have in the next 30 years, you can see here by the pixelation, this is a real um, uh, GIS map, the pixelation of the areas that will grow in population, and most of that growth will be in slums. In Africa, you can see already what will happen. Of course, Lagos takes a big cut, right? So the question is not whether buildings are sustainable, whether we put bicycle racks in green and collect the rainwater. The what's not sustainable is the amount of poverty in the world. So when I went to school, they taught me to design like this. Well, you cut a hill, you make some roads, some cars, and you call some architects to do some nice buildings along those roads, right? Until I saw this. And this was far more interesting. There are roads there. They're paths and alleyways, and there's a tight-knit community. They work together, they share together, and they have a dense urbanization. It's basically a new medieval city. And as you know, medieval cities had no property rights. They grew ad hoc, and they grew informally. So the problem is, however, these places have absent infrastructure. And we have a responsibility as citizens and architects and designers to bring distribution of equity, access, and social justice to these places. So as you see here in Caracas, there's, they have a right to the city. They have a right to infrastructure. They have a right to housing. And they have a right to have resilience to natural disasters. And we put together this book called Informal City a few years later to try and talk about this idea of what we call now today with my partners, uh, Andy and, and, um, and Luyanda, advanced 
blocking out to incremental formal compliance. What that means is let's create a house, an infrastructure, a city map, a kind of unit, let's say, of urbanization that can grow over time into formal uh, compliance because there's not enough money to do it formally and perfectly with insulation with all the things from day one. So you might know that this is the image of Le Corbusier um, a Maison Domino house, but this is the way cities are being built around the world uh, today. Um, they have obviously no a know-how and technology on concrete structures, right? They just cheap this material, they fill it in. Now, if you look at this photograph taken by us years ago, five years in between, you'll see this building looks pretty ugly, right? Informal. Maybe it should be knocked down. That's out of compliance. I think City Hall should, should knock it down. But you give him a little bit of time, and he finishes it, he stuccos it, puts a nice balcony. That's what the medieval city was all about. When you go to uh, old city, Zurich, Munich, wherever you want, old Paris, Mahé, or whatever, you will see that what's so interesting about the public spaces is that the buildings are in relationship and all skewed and one up, one back, because it's a relationship of negotiation. And that's the point. Architects need to incorporate people and the people on the ground into their schemes. So this is Horacio Genaro. We got lucky to find his old archive photographs. Him and his brother were banking the hill and building one of the slums in Caracas. And just like most developers, they made little parcels of land for their sister, their brother, their cousins, etc. They banked the hill with sandbags and they built a little shack. But over time, that little wooden shack was built up into a real decent kind of medieval city in, qu in quotation marks, right? So eventually we'll get stuccoed, eventually we'll get electricity or solar panels, or, and it will look like a normal city. So this is a little animation of how that process is. As they have a little more money, they, they keep the shack inside, and then they demolish it when they go to the next floor. And then on the last floor, they're already growing municipal herbs, and they've got chickens on the roof. So this is quite a beautiful section of these cities, of course, on the vertical, and how each house is terraced on top of the other. So my question to students, to everyone, is what kind of city do we want? Here we have the model of the RDP, of the suburban American house, which is what's been sold, what's in the minds of many of the individuals who are waiting on a list to get a house, but that doesn't make a city at all. In fact, what we need is dense urban blocks that actually form city like the cities we love. Now, how does that happen, that process of negotiation? Well, there's a guy in, in Zurich in 83 called Hans Widmer who wrote this book called Bolo Bolo, and he is actively saying we have to come together in associations. We have to develop blocks and places in association. So if the city created a legislation that allowed for community leaders and community um, organizations and NGOs to organize blocks, to block it out, it would be a way to go forward. And thousands of architects would be employed. And John Habracken in the 72 talked about open structures. So maybe we can do just the framework. Maybe architects don't have to go to the last detail. Maybe we can conceptualize the framework. Why? Because what's the way out of poverty? Migration. In one generation, the way out of poverty is to move and migrate. You know that from all South Africa receiving all the uh, immigrants from uh, neighboring countries. But Europe now, people are going up to Europe, right? So also, I like to tie back to history because I think that it's, we're not teaching history enough because we would then know and be able to not do all the errors. Um, this is an old image of a, of a kind of parking lot with houses by James Wine, site architects. But we actually found that in our trips in Caracas. We found a parking garage that was already being fitted out with offices, housing. And then we said, why don't we use a parking garage as refugee housing? In Munich, now that they've accepted 800,000 uh, immigrants and uh, refugees, they could use the parking garage. We don't need cars anymore. We can have electric tuk-tuks. So we designed this parking garage that is all revamped and could become these temporary new structures. But parking garages are actually pretty good because they are very flexible and they come in all shapes and sizes. Maybe we can even refine it. Maybe we can build them different. And maybe we can do temporary boxes on them. And so this is just a little animation of 
As their cars, no cars, maybe there's startup companies, maybe there are shops, maybe. So why don't we free up that a structure can change over time and be multi-use? And here you see a more rendered, finished image, and here a little simulation of that same structure over time. As, and it would be fantastic. You'd see the city changing every day. Why don't we accept ephemeral, changing, flexible? So this is the tower that I told you about, Torre David, smack in the middle of Caracas, Venezuela, in the downtown. It's also happening in urban areas, not only on the outskirts in the slums. Um, people are squatting because they have a necessity for homes. They don't want to be far away from the city, and they squat. So the building, the empty building, becomes a framework. 45 floors in the air. It was a bank that went under, and the government assumed the, the property of it, but didn't do anything. And one night after the rainstorm, people flocked in, and 3,000 families moved in. And they used the hardware, and then the software was tense, blocked, and over time, 17 years, they started to colonize the building. And we were in there for about a year, trying to tell the government to save it, to let this experiment go on, the sharing of food to our David, we presented the Venice Biennale, and these were some of the finished apartments we were able to do, with zero financing. They did it with their own finances. So the myth about that, that people don't have any money is not true. People all want a work, and they want to aspire to the same things we all do. But then we thought, OK, what would be a downtown scenario like Hong Kong or, or Sao Paulo or Caracas that's densely urbanized? Well, maybe. Torre David is a model, but let's reconceptualize it. Maybe we don't need an elevator inside, because the building had no elevator. So maybe we can do a public elevator. We can actually make bigger floors. Maybe people can build the, the floors in between so we don't have to do, pour so many floor slabs. And they can do lightweight steel structures, right? And then the elevator shack bank can be like a public piece of infrastructure, just like subways, trains, et cetera. It's a public transportation vertical system. And it connects to several buildings. And if you connect, to the system, then you, you get special benefits from the city. And so we imagine this the Torre David all redone, wind turbines, and we called it this urban parangole, based on a Brazilian artist, who, Elio Oiticica, who loved to walk around the city with colorful robes, and it was all about the interaction, the space between the robes and the people. But let's look at London. This is London. I'll try and make my point. Is London is made up of little villages. And not only that, they're not even gridded. They all are kind of medieval patterns, right? That's so interesting. So if you zoom in, you're going to see in the red, the red uh, zones are the highest traffic, traffic places in pedestrian traffic. So what happens is the more corners you have, the less orthogonal, the more dynamic that corner and that little village is. That's why it's so interesting to be in London, because it's different Chelsea from other places, et cetera. So we said, wow, how do we upgrade cities that have sprawled, like Mumbai, Lagos? Well, maybe we can start to make one kilometer bubbles, one kilometer radiuses. And we just forget about the in-between. We set those one kilometer radiuses where there's a bus stop, there's a subway stop. And here you see the one and two kilometers, right? And then maybe we free up the zoning in some kind of free zoning plan. We have all these elevators. And then if people connect to the system, and you can, you can uh, several ways of connecting. These are just sketches with little bridges, some of our work here connecting. Maybe rooftops connecting. We can create this kind of urban parangole, which means a kind of Brazilian samba urbanism, right? So here you see an image of that city connecting and the zoning rights. But you'd say, I'd get lost in that city. It would, be a, it would be a complete maze, a medieval city. But you've got the app. Who cares? You can find your way. You can find your friend on the 22nd floor. There's a movie playing on the 30th floor, etc. And you'd be walking through. The city would be infinitely more interesting. You'd have all mechanisms. You'd know when the elevator is coming. You'd know where the escalator will take you, etc., etc. So that's kind of this idea. Um, of the future city, all connected, all dense. And then we tried out, of course, some models of some buildings that would be totally connected to the system with public spaces all through. And this is a little render. We tried to get it built in Caracas, and um, a friend of ours got it built in Oslo. 
So yes, so what's the toolbox I told you about? One is to diagnose topography. Two, visualize social factors. Three, diagnose the morphology that's existing in each city. Reverse engineer that aggregation. Where are you going to put that aggregation? Capture all the resources you can, sun, rain, etc. Plug in infrastructures. Consolidate whatever infrastructure is there. Go with the grain. Sometimes you have to go against the grain. Capture unused spaces. Grow local. Consolidate the public space and go vertical, because there's no other way. We've got to go vertical. Land's way too expensive. Think topological, like think in typologies, and make networks. Make centers, prefabricate to get it cheap, and distribute freely. Give everyone the possibility to be incorporated. So now, the project that we came for, and I thank Indaba. It's been an incredible, incredible day. And, um, and I'm sure this will continue into the future. So this is the Empower Shack. It's in Kailiche's BT section, just off the N2, off Muway. The idea is to take an area of informal settlement and turn it into a kind of row house situation, like the Burkhab or District 6 might have been. Very thin and small row houses. But we won't build the full house. We'll build half a house. We'll build the infrastructure and then let the community finish it off because it goes on and on, the Cape Flats, right? You all know where Kalisha is. There's about 700,000 people living there. This is BT section. We're very privileged today to have some of the community leaders sitting here. So this is what we found, but they were willing, and Pumezo was willing together with Andy, the NGO that kind of organized the situation, and they were willing to see what we could do. So the first thing was to map it out. We had to map it and figure out. And then Pumezo said, I'll make an example. Totally, it was seen in the good eyes of the city that we would work there, but we had no permits. We just did it, right? And I remembered from my trips to India that I'd already seen people going up with kind of shacks vertically, and they were very interesting. So I started to draw some ideas and you know, this knowledge ecology. So we brought in programmers, we brought in specialists and engineers, De Vier's and whom, we brought in DSA, and we brought in, and we started to bring in sanitation experts and solar experts. Hence the idea of empower. But we saw exactly the prototype we were talking about just a few meters away. People had already begun to do it. So we took Pumezo and some of the, um, the leaders up to our, our Swiss a teaching uh, pl um, platform. We worked on it in the summer. We got funding for it, and we started to come out with a very simple, very boiled down idea with just a couple of moves, lifting the house off the ground so it didn't flood, et cetera, and Pumezo volunteered to knock down house. You can imagine the only thing he had was his house, and, and without any security, whether that would be taken away from him, he volunteered, very courageous, and he's been leading uh, uh, along with the rest of the community leaders. And the house actually transformed. It's become very important icon in the community. So we said, so how would we do this? What's the idea? How could we do it? Well, we thought very hard. We thought we could do these houses one at a time, one at a time, iterate, move, iterate, move, and create these courtyards. But then we got scared with the fire. We said, no, and not only that, the land was too valuable. We needed every inch of space because it's only 3,500 square meters uh, and we needed to accommodate 72 families and houses. So we said, okay, let's do an idea. There's, a, there's one guy who has very little money, but he has a big plot of land because he came a long time ago, he's older, etc. And there's another guy who's young, he's a new resident, back check or whatever, who has a lot of money because he's got a good job, but he came late and he has just a little shack. So if we create an internal market between people, we can say maybe we can do a land release credit. And then after a while, we will all, it will compensate land and money. So we went house to house trying to find out uh, who had, what jobs, et cetera, income, income sizes, house sizes that they would need. We kind of did a whole mapping, and we came up with this idea of land readjustment, and, and, um, and we made land credit. Now, how does that work? Well, we also then began to look at the sizes. We brought the community to a warehouse, and then we mapped each house up. 
And then we saw if we reduce the footprint of the existing houses and we go vertically with a double story, we would gain shops on the ground floor, and now we're going three stories even, and we can then work. So we worked with the community, we created a whole board game, people enjoyed that very much, Notombi's here, and the community agreed. Not only that, because this is ETH, uh, they like uh, gadgets, and actually, this gadget is very interesting. You can go to any settlement now, we've worked on it for now two years, you go in, you, you propose a roads distribution system, you're there standing in with the community, what you used to do with a pen and paper, and then once the roads have been established, the community agrees, we'll do one road here, the people affected, the houses affected, give, uh, give, agree to give it up, you then take him back out, and you type in his name, you say the size of the house, you re-block it out, and then over time, you do his neighbor, where does he want to live, it goes back in, etc. And over time, I won't bother you with the whole program and simulation because there's many more things to come. You eventually leave the site with a blocking out plan. It's not a perfect plan. It won't be the only plan, but it will be a, an agreement. It is a document to work forward with. So here's just the stages. Here's a little simulation of what that would do. So over time, this is what we would do during the day. People would then figure out where the roads go, where do they want to live, etc. And this would then be our working document. And this is finally the real plan. Slowly, stage by stage, each house is moved very slowly. Why is this not really attractive to developers? Why is it not attractive necessarily to the city? because it requires a lot of time and a lot of people and a lot of people engage, a lot of talking and a lot of going back and forth. But you see, it's going to end up to be something that people care about. It will be socially sustainable. I'm not so interested anymore with sustainability from a conventional point of view. I'm interested in social sustainability. In other words, how do people feel? How are they at the end of the day? Do they identify with their community, with their space? Do they feel that they've been empowered by their space? Do they, and, and actually, have they bettered themselves to, and look forward to the future? So here you see the whole blocking. <laughs> so it doesn't end there, of course. Light is important, and obviously satellite TV and, and internet's important. So we see the whole rooftops with solar. And we're working right now with a solar company, and it looks like it's going to be great. And we will then do feed-in tariff right back into the system. They will get a discount on their metering because you know that in, in these informal shacks, they do have a subsidy, but it's very little. It hardly runs uh, a couple of lights in the kitchen. And then if you cluster them around a courtyard and you start to share the solar panels and you start to share the internet points and the satellite TV, they will reduce their cost rather than every house having a point. And then toilets, of course. It's just not right and not proper. Very dangerous. These toilets as they go out at night. This is not a proper system. We should not endorse it anymore. What should be happening is we should have an army of young kids coming out of university helping the city and organizing this. And it is not too difficult. And a lot of people want to do it. And so one water tap. Imagine the fire, right? But then Reuse all the excess water, all the water running off the roofs. You can reuse it into a green system, which would change the climate, of course. So this idea of temporary permanence, right? Temporary permanence, right? Contradiction of sorts. But you all know that these settlements were deemed temporary, but now they're permanent, just like refugee camps, right? So why don't we start to think about that idea, that contradiction of incremental uh, permanence, right? So we said, we're scared about the fire, get rid of the wood. We started to make new sketches, and we started to use block walls, very thin block walls, reinforced by our engineers. And then we said, OK, with the city, we'll negotiate. We're fine to do allotments. Um, each lot will be fine. So we made 
We made ideas for the courtyards, the walls of the firewalls. We made it very tight like the Burkhab. Of course, we began, these are just some early sketches of the house. We left room for the house to grow. The community can decide what windows to put on the front and on the back. So what we build is only the roof and the framework. So this is the first house. This is Pumeso's first house that's turned into a community center. And then at the end of the road, you see the new townhouses being built. And I'll take you just quickly through them. They're obviously not finished. Here you see us studying the block walls. Now you might say, where's the design? Well, the design is precisely in the simplicity, is getting it to cost, getting it half the price of an RDP house. That's the design. And getting a bathroom in there that reuses uh, water, and et cetera. Then determining not one block less. Not, and then in the design of those block walls, determine where, where do you set back a block. So we have to do several plans where we indicate where blocks set back, where there's reinforcement. And actually, these walls, these infrastructural walls, becomes a huge design element. Who said a toilet's not a design element, right? And so, and the story goes on and on, and each house is a different width, because depending on what they can pay with their microcredit and loan system, um, they uh, choose the width of their house, and depending on the size of the family. So these very simple houses can become very interesting design objects. And, I, and then here's the exploded axon. Then we won't finish the house. We'll give it raw, open space. We'll work with the community. They'll build it themselves. So together, it will be finished. But over time, subdivision walls can be put in. So, and same with the facades. Over time, these are very quick, bad sketches. Later, we take them into digital. Then each facade can change. You can open up more windows. And we'll eventually go to three stories, right? And we're making studies now what the density could be and what the size of the houses could be. And color studies about what panels could go in and et cetera. And this is what we envisioned. Then there's some urban agriculture, very important. It's not going to solve the food problem, but it brings the community together. So this whole idea is how do you empower the community to be more cohesive, to resist politically eviction, et cetera. So, there you see that the landscaping will also help determine that the roads are not full of cars. Why? Because this is a car-free city for 250 families. We will let the cars be able to be on the outskirts, on the outsides, and then here you see the landscaping coming in, the framework, as I said, building the shacks, and this difference between the RDP. And they're not finished, they're not painted, and you have these interstitial spaces, a tree, and this tree is outside of the earth, but yet every resident gets his tree, he waters it, he takes care of it. And here you see the simplicity of the interiors, and almost done, I just want you guys to get the full feeling of the house. Now I ask you, the point is we all want to ask, why is it that we've built the first houses and yet they're not hooked up with water and no sanitation. The city knows very well, but they don't act fast enough. And I would like to ask the community to come up because they're here, the whole team is here. And what I want to show with that is that it's not me. I'm just kind of a city producer, orchestrator, um, uh, networker, but the community and the team that's sitting there, please come up just quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you.